Hello, this is Tommy Franks. Welcome to the Four Star Leadership Podcast, a product of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum. We're here to get a view into the lives of the legacy makers, the movers and the shakers of today, to offer insights from the full spectrum of the leadership community. We'll talk to former Four Star students and explore their leadership development path. We'll work to find out what they are about today and learn from the opportunities they've made for themselves in this world. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this podcast. Remember, leaders are not born, they're developed. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Core Principles of Leadership with General Tommy Franks. I am your host, Delise Travis. We are on episode 13 with our guest, Mike Turpin, and we'll be talking about all four of the individual core principles of leadership, caring, communication, common vision, and character, and the importance of incorporating all four of the principles into your leadership style. But before we get into our program, we'll have a word from our major sponsor, REI Oklahoma. REI Oklahoma is proud to be a part of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and the production and distribution of these podcasts designed to inspire leaders and difference makers. At REI Oklahoma, we have been working with small business leaders, entrepreneurs, and people who are driven to succeed for years. Highly motivated people working to own their own businesses, live in their own homes, and make the world a better place. Since its beginning, REI Oklahoma has continued to identify hurdles and deliver holistic solutions to create job growth and help neighborhoods thrive in both rural and urban communities. REI Oklahoma looks forward to visiting with you about helping your business and community grow. Visit reiok.org or call 800-658-2823 to start the conversation. And now we join our guest, Mike Turpin. Michael C. Turpin was born in Tulsa, educated in Tulsa Public Schools, and graduated from the University of Tulsa, earning a Bachelor of Science degree in History and a Juris Doctor degree. In 1982, Mr. Turpin was elected Attorney General for the State of Oklahoma. He served as Muskogee County District Attorney from 1977 to 1982. Since 1987, Mr. Turpin has been a partner in the law firm of Riggs, Abney, Neal, Turpin, Orbison, and Lewis in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. While no longer serving in public office, Mr. Turpin remains politically active. He appears weekly on Oklahoma City NBC affiliate K4's award-winning public affairs show, Flashpoint with Turpin and Lamb. He appeared twice on ABC's Politically Incorrect with Bill Maurer and was featured on PBS's national documentary, Vote for Me, Politics in America. He had a long-running monthly column, Turpin Time, for the OPEA monthly newsletter and was featured columnist for Microsoft Internet magazine, Slate. Mr. Turpin is a nationally sought-after public speaker and has received awards, honors, and appointments too numerous to name for his service to community. Please welcome Mr. Mike Turpin. Good afternoon, Mr. Turpin. Thank you so much. We are honored to have you here with us today on Four Core Principles of Leadership with General Tommy Franks. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be a part of the program. I have a lot of respect for General Tommy Franks and his leadership institution. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, you were our keynote speaker at our awards banquet the very first year that I came to this program about six years ago. And I don't remember a lot of it because I was a nervous wreck, but I know it was really awesome because everyone else told me it was really awesome. I was just trying to make sure everything came off just right. And I know you know how that goes. So I've been really excited to visit with you and uh, talk about our program and about your experiences and how they relate to our program. First of all, would you give us a little bit more insight? We know from your bio that you grew up in Tulsa and um, were educated in Tulsa. Can you tell me a little bit about your parents and your home life growing up? Um, Yes, Uh, thanks for asking. I never get tired of uh, talking about 
my family and how I grew up because I'm so proud of them and I'm proud of how they raised me. My mom and dad gave me roots and wings and, uh, I, I, you know, I flew away. I took off and grew up in North Tulsa, uh, born in Tulsa, grew up in Tulsa, grew up in North Tulsa. I like to say that proudly, Delise, because there's South Tulsa where you have Southern Hills Country Club. And uh, that's where all the demographically, the richer folks live. I grew up in uh, North Tulsa, demographically where the working folks live. We, we, we weren't as well off, but my dad ran a printing press and when he died, he had printer's ink under his fingernails. My mother dispatched dump trucks. Uh, she worked at a trucking company. So I just grew up in a working class family. And um, I had an older brother who eventually became a preacher, a Cumberland Presbyterian Church preacher. I have a younger brother who's now the president of the Owasso School Board. And he is a very successful business guy. I'm very proud of him. And I eventually, oh, graduated from McLean High School in North Tulsa, went off to the University of Tulsa got an undergraduate degree. I was going to be a history teacher. And I decided, wait a minute, I think I might keep going and get a law degree. And I did. I saw a lot of shows on television about Perry Mason. And I thought, I, I think I want to be a real life lawyer. I want to be like Abraham Lincoln, a, a real life lawyer like he was. I want to be like, like Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. I want to be a lawyer like him. So I got a law degree. And I've been practicing law ever since. That's how I got started. And thanks for asking. Well, you're so welcome. I think it's it's always really interesting to find out about people. It seems like those that really excel are the ones that had to start out kind of scratching, you know, for a living and, and really working hard. And as you said, you know, your fingernails weren't always the cleanest because you're really scratching out a living. And I, I appreciate knowing about your family and the obvious character and integrity that they instilled in each of you. So and that Delise, we're- Delise, you thank you for what you just said. And it makes me think of one other thing. Uh, when you say scratching and clawing and all that is, I mean, the truth is I happen to believe the greatest advantage is no advantage at all. I mean, Absolutely. the greatest advantage- yeah, the greatest advantage may be no advantage at all. I mean, it, it, it's, we had love and encouragement in my family. We just didn't have much material wealth. So we had to work really hard for everything. And all along the way, all the things I've already described to you, I work part-time jobs everywhere. I waited tables at steak and ale for five years. I encourage everybody to be a waiter. I learned a lot about it. Oh, I do to, too. Yeah, thank you, Delise. I mean, I learned a lot about humility and how to work with people. I was standing at the closet Sears for three years. Now, that was a seasonal job, the Sears department store. I mean, it was only around Christmas, don't you see? And then I drove a forklift at McKissick Products, a big manufacturing plant in Tulsa. I, I, I sold donuts on Saturday morning, riding around on a swim bicycle. I mean, anything I could do to make a little extra money, it taught me how to be a very young entrepreneur and how to work hard for a living. You don't grind, you don't shine. That works in my life, Delise. You don't grind, you don't shine. You got to work hard. You got to grind. You must be laborious before you can be glorious. I just made that up. You must be laborious before you can be glorious. Work ethic. Work ethic matters. Go ahead, Delise. I digress. Absolute, absolutely, it does. And I, I think that is what is so great. And it's the greatest story and the most interesting human interest stories behind some of our greatest leaders. And speaking of leaders and our leadership program, we always talk about our four core principles of leadership that drive and are the focus of our leadership program. And that's kind of what we're gonna, we decided that we would talk about today. And when we interview our student applicants, they, uh, we always ask them, of the four core principles, which are caring, communication, common vision, and character, which ones are the most important to them? Which ones do they think are the most important in developing an, an inherent quality in a great leader? And it's always interesting to get their take on which are the most important and why. So would you share with us, um, caring is our first core principle of leadership. And as General Frank says, you have to care about the people you lead so that, you know, they will trust you to lead them. So share with us your thoughts on caring. My first reaction to your question about caring is to put it in the context of what we've all gone through with 
the pandemic. I came out of the pandemic more committed to two things than anything else. I came out of the pandemic committed to God and gratitude. God and gratitude. I'm much more active in my church uh, than I ever was before, frankly. I'm an elder. I'm one of the leaders in my church now. And, um, and gratitude. I, I'm just so grateful to be alive. I'm so grateful for my family. I'm so grateful for anybody that's ever helped me in my life. And, and that was coming out of, of the pandemic. And I immediately went to work in my community, you know, with United Way. Uh, I was a co-chair of a campaign to raise $20 million in Oklahoma City, in central Oklahoma, with Judy Love, Mike Turpin, Judy Love, Judy Love, Mike Turpin. We, we, we actually raised $20 million in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. That's because amazing. Found, yeah, thank you. We found out that people really cared about each other. This is something I came up with to capture the feeling of, of the pandemic and caring back to your word, caring for each other. We all became first responders to each other. We all became first responders to each other during the pandemic. I like to believe in, in my part of the state, Oklahoma City, we had a community revival. We had a civic renaissance. Empathy made a comeback. Empathy made a comeback in this country, in this world during the pandemic. And think about this, there's about 330 million Americans, okay? There's about 8 yeah. billion people on this planet, 8 billion. So we all went through the same thing at the same time. The pandemic impacted the whole country and impacted the whole planet. 300 million plus in America, 8 billion on the planet, a shared vulnerability, a shared humanity. We all went through the pandemic at the same time together. Uh, very seldom does it happen in world history that we all go through the same thing at the same time. We did, and people cared about each other. And I was so pleased to see that, hear me, all of us need all of us. I think we learned that all of us need all of us. You got to believe in we instead of me. We're all fellow travelers on the spaceship Earth. Caring, caring. We got to care for each other. And I must tell you, that my pastor at my church always closes every sermon with hold fast to what is good. Hold fast to what is good. And I dare say what Tommy Franks and what you're doing with the high school students, leadership, hold fast to what is good. These are all good ideals. And caring is a good one to start with. Hold fast to what is good, what we all do for each other. All of us need all of us. We're all in this thing together. And I think that became abundantly true more than ever before to me coming out of the pandemic and what we all had to do for each other. We were all first responders to each other. Thank goodness and thank God. Absolutely. And one of the stories from General Frank's book is that when he was a little boy, um, and, and this is a little twist on it, when he was a little boy, his father was repairing the barn because, you know, and in our day and, and in the rural areas, we, we just don't go by new. We repair what we have. So his dad was repairing the barn and he was using a saw and General Franks was just a little boy. And of course, he wanted to, to saw as well. So his dad gave him a little scrap of board and a saw and he, he pushed and pushed and pushed and he just couldn't get it to happen. Nothing was working. His, and his dad said, you have to pull the saw to you first before you can push it away. He said, that was my first lesson in leadership. You have to pull people to you first before you can push them to greatness and, and be a great leader. And so I think that your thoughts about the pandemic are so on point and so close to us all is caring about the people that we're leading. It was so, so important. We had to think of everybody, not just ourselves. Uh, we had to think of everybody's welfare. And, and how it was going to affect everyone else. So I think that is such an important point. And Delise, when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, here's the motto of my life relative to helping each other and giving. If you ain't giving, you ain't living. If you, I mean, for, for anybody that's listening to this podcast, hear me now, believe me later. If you ain't giving, you ain't living. That's what life is all about. That's what Tommy Franks is all about. That's what you're that's right. doing. Your Leadership Institute is all about. Thank you, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Well, Living thank you. I'm, I'm very proud because I feel like that when General Franks retired, he just didn't go into retirement and, and enjoy life, you know, just kind of 
going through life and just not doing anything. He's still working. He and his wife founded this leadership program because he cares about the leaders of our future. And I just think it's, um, it, it's really a great program and, and it really gives us a lot of fulfillment every day to come to work and, and it's, it's, I can't say enough nice things about it. But anyway, uh, moving on to our next core principle is communication. How important is communication? Listening, uh, the dialogue between people, the, the content, um, to show respect when you're listening, comprehend, make sure that they understood you and you understood them and confirm. So uh, communication is so, so important. You wanna share with us about communication. Well, as, as a leader in this state, uh, I've learned that good communication starts with active listening. I mean, I like to talk and uh, I've enjoyed visiting with you already, but I've also learned along the way Listen, learn, and lead. Listen, learn, and lead. Any young person that listens to our podcast and wants to run for student council president or seventh grade class president or whatever, they need, he needs, she needs to listen, learn, and lead. Now, my next thought is, if you're going to communicate with a group of people, you need to have a theme. I've always thought you should never break the silence of a room with the sound of your voice unless you have a theme. In Delise. I've traveled all over the state, all over the country, frankly, but all over the state of Oklahoma, mostly. And I like to give a five minute commencement address. And everybody likes me because they, they don't want a 20 or 30 minute commencement address when they graduate from high school, when they graduate from college. Hobart High School or Swazoo out there in Weatherford, they want a commencement speaker that might speak five minutes. Anyway, my, my, theme when I'm communicating with young people about leadership is get ready, a funny bone, a backbone, and a wishbone. A funny bone, a backbone, and a wishbone. A funny bone is a sense of humor. A backbone is a sense of courage. And a wishbone is a sense of idealism. So very briefly, a funny bone. Shakespeare said, show me a man who never makes a joke, and I'll show you a man who stands as a joke to the whole world. You got to have the quality, I think, of self-directed humor. Don't make fun of other people, but make fun of yourself. And um, I like to say in high school basketball, they called me the minute man. I kept saying, coach, can I play? He said, in a minute, man, just sit down and be quiet for gosh sakes. So I spent more time to lease on the bench than Judge Judy did or has. Anyway, that's an example of self-directed humor. Funny bone, sense of humor, backbone, a sense of courage. Courage to do what you believe is right. I tell my own sons and daughters and any young person listening in, if you have the courage to do what you believe is right, you can be alone without being lonely. You can be alone without being lonely, even on a Saturday night, because you feel good about who you are. You have self-respect because you've made good choices in your life. You've had the courage to do what you believe is right. And courage is being scared, but saddling up anyway. It's not always easy to be courageous, but courage is being scared, but saddling up anyway. Funny bones, a sense of humor, backbones, a sense of courage, and a wishbone is a sense of idealism. And what I mean by that is we're all in this thing together. You know, we instead of me, we're all brothers and sisters, and we're all in all this together. And um, I like to say the two pillars, the, the two pillars of Western civilization that make America the greatest country in the whole world, I think, is the belief that tomorrow can be better than today. and it's our personal moral obligation to make it so. So, you know, we're all in this thing together. We got to help each other. A funny bone, a backbone, and a wishbone. Now, that's an example, Delise, of a theme. If you're going to communicate with people, you can't just start talking. You got to have a theme. Winston Churchill on the floor of Parliament during World War II. He's trying to motivate the world to extricate ourselves from the stranglehold of Adolf Hitler. He said, Delise, get ready. If the British Empire lasts for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. That's Winston Churchill mobilizing, you know, the whole world against Hitler in World War II. Well, you know what JFK, you know what President Kennedy said about Churchill? He said he mobilized the English language and he sent it into battle. He mobilized the English language and he sent it into battle. 
because he had a theme. He knew what he wanted to say. He didn't just get up and wing it. The least, one last example. I've argued in front of the United States Supreme Court. As Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma, I, Mike Turpin, argued in front of the United States Supreme Court. And my theme to the United States Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., my mother was there to get to watch her son do all that. That was a big moment for me. Yes, I can imagine. Chief Justice, my name is Mike Turpin. I'm Attorney General of the State of Oklahoma. I'm here to advocate for the Reverend Richard Douglas and his wife, Marilyn. I said, they're dead, they're gone, they're murdered. It was a murder case. It was horrible. It was tragic. I said, I'm here to make sure they don't become forgotten people in the criminal justice system. I'm here to make sure they don't become forgotten people in the criminal justice system. If you're going to advocate for somebody to lease, you got to make sure they don't become forgotten people. If you're going to communicate, you got to have a theme. And my theme in that presentation was forgotten people. I wanted to make sure the victims of that awful crime would not be for, would, would never become forgotten people. So I'm, I'm just suggesting to anybody listening in, don't ever get up and make a presentation unless you've thought about a theme that you're going to use throughout the presentation. Whether you, it's a funny bone, backbone, wishbone, or Winston Churchill, or Mike Turpin in front of the United States Supreme Court. You break the silence of a room with the sound of your voice, you got to have a theme. you got to be prepared. That's how you effectively communicate, I do believe. I believe so too. And I am thinking about when we start our program with the students and part of their competition at four star leadership is essay. Um, I'm sorry, not essay is speech. And so, and, and it is essay, but I'm thinking of speech. They, some of them have never given a speech before. Some are speech contest winners and they can stand up in front of everyone and give a speech all day long. But I always told them it doesn't matter whether you've never given a speech or you've, you're a speech contest winner, you, we will meet you where you are and you still are going to, as a leader, at some point have to stand up in front of a group of people and share your thoughts and, and ideals and lead this group into sharing your vision. And so that brings me to the very next core principle, which is common vision. So we want to share our beliefs and share the theme of what we want to say so that we can share a common vision and get everyone on board. Vision is the ability to see where you want to end up and how to get there, the ability to move beyond your present reality to accomplish something noteworthy. So truly holding a vision, can you share with us your thoughts on common vision? Once again, it'll be a personal example in my life, but I'm, I'm the past chair of the bombing memorial in Oklahoma City. So for those that don't know, the bomb went off in Oklahoma City about 26 years ago. And we have what's called the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum. We have a museum and we have a memorial that surrounds the museum. And 26 years ago, when the bomb went off in Oklahoma City, we believe we want to believe, Delise, that we turned our darkest hour into our finest hour. We turned our darkest hour into our finest hour after Oklahoma City was bombed 26 years ago. We went from recovery to resilience to renaissance. We achieved victory over victimization. And Delise, we call that the Oklahoma standard. Our common vision in Oklahoma City, in Oklahoma to a certain extent, is the Oklahoma standard. And the Oklahoma standard clearly means that you're always at your best when pulling together and working together. And so the common vision that unites us at Oklahoma City at the Memorial Museum after the bomb went off here 26 years ago was and is the Oklahoma standard and being the best you could be, helping each other. Well, I kind of believe maybe it should be the American standard. Why, why can't the Oklahoma standard be the American standard? You know, all of us in this thing together. And when I think of a common vision, I like to think also in terms of President Kennedy. President Kennedy once said, Delise, this is pretty simple and straightforward, but it's beautiful when you think of common vision and, and, and a common bond and a common denominator among all of us in all times, in all places. The president said, we all inhabit the same earth. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And indeed, we're all mortal. You know, those are things that he said that I believe 
brings all of us together. We can all agree on that. So, so in, you know, a common vision is all about collaboration. And I think as much as possible, bringing people together. And, and I think all of us can agree that we all inhabit the same earth. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And indeed, we're all mortal. We're all in this thing together. But when you, as a leader, you're trying to develop that, that common vision as much as possible. And like I said, in Oklahoma City, we believe even after a tragedy like the bombing, you know, the president came to town after that 26 years ago. And he said, Oklahoma City, you broke our hearts, but you lifted our spirits. You broke our hearts, Oklahoma City, by the bombing happening and, and all the people that died. But you, you, you broke our hearts, but you lifted our spirits based on how you pulled together and came together as a community. And that we call the Oklahoma standard, people pulling together and working together. I dare say it should be the American standard. That is an example of a common vision that I have utilized in my lifetime. And I think it's a great one. You know, we always take our students to the Memorial Museum and tour the museum and, and talk about the situation. And I think what is so critical about the common vision is that not only in, had this never happened in Oklahoma, it had never happened in our nation ever. And so yeah. it happened right here in our state. And so we were able to not only reach out to each other and recover from that, but when the Twin Towers were hit, we knew and had experience how to reach out to the people of New York City and help. And absolutely we did. And I, I think- they yes. came to us. You're exactly right. You know, the bombing here is 26 years ago. Well, about six, seven years later was Twin Towers in New York, 9-11. And you're right. I've been there to their memorial. And just like we have a survivor tree, they have a survivor tree. Just like we have a prominent use of water, they have a prominent use of water. Just like we have every name of every victim identified, they've done the same thing. So I was talking to their director and said, that's what we have in Oklahoma City. And they said, Mike, we came to Oklahoma City. We borrowed all those ideas from Oklahoma City's memorial when we built the memorial in New York City after 9-11. That phrase, that word is called memorialization. When something bad happens, how do you memorialize what happened and the people that were victimized? Memorialization is a big word that I've learned through all this. But you're right. We have good, solid, wonderful memorialization in Oklahoma City at the Memorial Museum. I'm glad you've been there. I'm glad the students come there. And thanks for bringing up 9-11. They came to Oklahoma City and learned from us. And I hate to say it, but calamities and tragedies happen all over the world. And when they do, they are brothers and sisters in spirit with the people of Oklahoma City when something bad happens somewhere else. You wouldn't believe how many people we've taken through our memorial and museum from other cities and other countries where something bad has happened. And they decided to come to see us on learning how to memorialize back home in their city or their country what happened to them. And so, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the work we've done in Oklahoma City. I'm proud of the Oklahoma Standard. And a closing thought on that, Delise, is every major religion believes that we are all touched with a divine spark of infinite goodness. So for all the young people thinking about a common vision for whatever their cause may be, we are all touched with a divine spark of infinite goodness. So try to find that goodness and bring that goodness out in other people. Goodness is one of the strongest forces on this earth. Just the whole concept of goodness, a divine spark of infinite goodness. That's within every one of us. I, I totally agree. And I know that, and, and I know you know, there are so many when you walk through our 9-11 exhibit here at the uh, General Tommy Franks Museum, because we do have a, an original steel beam from the from ground zero here. There are so many personal and touching stories about how we reached out to each other, how groups who were here then were in Oklahoma City. I mean, we're, I mean that were here in Oklahoma City that went to New York City and, and reached out and helped and they knew how because they'd already been through it. And it, it was a tragic experience, but from tragedy comes something really great. As you said, our darkest hour becomes our finest hour. Before we move on to our final principle, let's take a minute to hear from one of our important sponsors, Krieger Insurance. 
Hello, this is Jay Zacharias with the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum, and I would like to tell you about one of our partner sponsors. His name is Justin Krieger, and he has worked as an independent insurance agent at Krieger Insurance Agency in his hometown of Hobart, Oklahoma since 1999. Justin is honored to help with the annual Celebration of Freedom event and has been a board member for the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum for many years. He is also a fifth generation farmer and rancher in Kiowa County, where cattle, crops, and even insurance is sold with a handshake. Give him a call at 580-726-3076 or come by the office if you would like to speak with Justin Krieger or Kathy Lankford about insurance. We are thankful to our customers and friends who have supported us through the years. Again, Justin would like to say how honored he is to live in such a great country and how proud he is to help sponsor these podcasts. Please enjoy the rest of this podcast experience from your friends at Krieger Insurance Agency. And yes. that brings me to character. And character, I think, is um, it's often touted by the students as one of the most important core principles. I think they're all very important. But as we know, character is being consistent in what you say you will do and what you actually do. There's character and integrity. And um, I have some interesting thoughts from um, a gentleman who really worked on that at the Center of Human Performance, Dr. Jim Lauer, but I'm really interested in uh, what your thoughts are on character. And, and Delise, if I was one of the students that you interviewed and asked them what's the most important quality out of these four that we've talked about, three of them already, yes. but I would say character. Uh, I'd say without character, nothing else matters that much. I know you can say, well, of course it does. Really? I mean, if you don't lead by example with character, like Tommy Franks has done his whole life, I mean, what else is there to say? I mean, I can't hear you because of what I see you doing. Wrong. If you're doing something wrong, I can't quite hear you because of what I see you doing. You got to lead right. by example. You got to have character. And char hear me, character is destiny. Character is destiny. And I've got a book. In fact, I have it right here. I'm looking at it. It's called The Road to Character by David Brooks. The Road to Character by David Brooks. Let me just share with you the premise of his book. He believes in our lives, Delise, that there's resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues and eulogy virtues. I want to break that down for the students that are listening in. A resume virtue is a high school degree, maybe a college degree maybe some kind of certification. So a, a resume virtue is on your resume. It's a degree, it's a certification, it's a professional accomplishment. That's a resume virtue. A eulogy virtue is what they will say about you at your own funeral, because life is terminal. Someday we will all die. What will they say about you at your own funeral? That is what you call a eulogy virtue. And a eulogy virtue would be like courage, compassion, integrity, faithfulness, dedication. Resume virtues or degrees, that's good. It's necessary. Eulogy virtues are what they'll say about you at your own funeral based on how you've treated other people, how you've lived your life with character, because character is destiny. And I happen to believe if, if you live your life just right, they might talk about your eulogy virtues while you're still alive. They might say, look at how that man, how that woman, how that young man, how that young woman leads and lives their life. And they teach by example. They lead by example. And I like to say in my life, and I'll do this every Sunday afternoon, I stop and think about what I call the Mike Turpin 4F Club. And I didn't say 4-H. I love 4-H. I didn't say FFA. I love FFA. But this is just my own you know, Mike Turpin 4F Club, if I'm teaching a Sunday school class at Westminster Presbyterian Church, as a matter of fact. And I like to say, all that matters in life is faith, family, and friends. All that matters in life is faith, family, and friends. And somebody will always raise their hand and say, but Mr. Turpin, Big Mike, you said 4F. I said, oh, that's right. To support your faith, to take care of your family, and to have fun with your friends, you got to have money. 
You got to get a good education. You got to get a good job because life is all about faith, family, friends, and finances and finances. And how you balance those four is the opportunity and the challenge of life. And faith, it's whatever you want it to be. Just don't be a spiritual spectator, though. You know, separate the ever fleeting from the everlasting. You know, whatever your faith is, work on that. I'm not going to tell you what you should believe. You know, decide that for yourself, but work on it. Faith matters. Don't be a spiritual spectator. Turn your theology into biography. Think about that, Delise. Turn your theology into biography. Whatever your theological beliefs are, it should be a part of the biography of your own life. Not just at Sunday school, but all week, your whole life. That's what character is all about. Faith, family, what's more important in our lives than family? My wife and my kids, man, oh, man. And Susan and I have a perfect marriage. I don't try to run her life, and I don't try to run mine either. See, that's a joke, but that's a perfect marriage. You know what I'm okay. <laughs> that's and my, a great and my, Yeah, and my three kids are doing wonderful, and I'm always running for father of the year, and it's usually a close vote, two to one, one way or the other. You know, but faith, family, and friends, when I got beat for governor, my slogan when I went, became attorney general of the state of Oklahoma, my slogan was, it's time for Turpin, it's Turpin time. And I won. I was attorney general of the state of Oklahoma. Then I got beat for governor. And, and I like to say a few good friends came walking in when everybody else went walking out. A few good friends came walking in when everybody else went walking out. So, you know, you know, dance with the one who brought me. Don't ever walk past an old friend to shake hands with a new friend. So people listening in, you got friends right now that you're going to have for the rest of your life and, and cherish them and, and be kind to them. And so I like to say faith, family, friends, and of course, finances means get a good education and get a good job and to support your faith, to take care of your family and have fun with your friends. You got to have finances, faith, family, friends, and finances. And the least how you balance those four is the opportunity, the challenge, the wonder of life. And throughout all that, you're exhibiting your character. Why? Because character is destiny. You know, this reminds me, and, and I know that you will enjoy this discussion, is I was telling you about, I overheard, well, I listened to an interview with a gentleman named Dr. Jim Lair, and he was the founder yeah. of the, the Center for Human Performance. And he has written several books on character, which he feels are very important. But he was he was asked to study the performance of elite performers, some of our greatest athletes, some of our greatest performance, performers of all time. And what made them different? What made them special? And he said, well, you know, first of all, and they did a tremendous amount of research. So this just wasn't theory. There was a tremendous tremendous amount of research involved. And so the, the first thing was he said, well, to be an elite performer, you have to have energy. And that comes from your nutrition and from your, a lot of that comes from your spiritual energy, your spirit, which is your faith. And then those develop into your character and your character is what drives you, your discipline and, and time management so that you can do all the things that you need to do to become an elite performer and and that's your character but he said there's another side of your character that is your moral and integrity that if you don't have one without the other you become a a person who will climb over dead bodies to get to the top but you're not bringing anyone with you you're not treating other people right and how important that is that so many elite performers got to the top and they they won all the gold buckles and, and all the, the titles and over and over and over, but they were unfulfilled. And so what they found was they didn't feel fulfilled until they reached out and started giving back. And so I think that is such an important part of it. And it, it meant so much to me. And I'm just curious about what your thoughts on that, because it, to me, it goes back to your resume versus your eulogy. Who did you bring with you on, on the road to your success? And, and how did you mentor and help other people? And Elise, think about this basic fundamental principle of life. You could buy, you could buy a house, but you can't buy a home. You could buy people, but you cannot buy friends. You could buy a reputation, but you cannot buy character. So the most important things in life, the least, can never be purchased. They're found within us. 
So think about that. You can buy a house, but you really can't buy a home. You can buy a million dollar house, but that doesn't make it a home. No. You, you, you can buy people, but you can't buy friends. I mean, and, 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 and you can buy a reputation kind of, but you can never buy character. So that, that's what they're saying. I mean, you got to live it and you got to realize the most important qualities in life, they're, they're found within us. And, and I like to quote Sandra Day O'Connor. One of my favorite Supreme Court judges was Sandra Day O'Connor. She said, the secret to happiness is three words. Work that matters. Work that matters. Work that matters. We all find ourselves to be happier people, more fulfilled people when we're doing work that matters, whatever that might be. In my family, we have a lot of school teachers and teachers impact eternity. Educators impact eternity. The teachers in my family, Billy Graham says that a teacher in one year impacts more people's lives than most other people do in a whole lifetime. So that, that's work that matters. Whatever young people decide to do with faith, family, friends, and finances, finances, whatever your job is, it needs to be work that matters to you and the people around you. Because the secret to happiness, so says Sandra Day O'Connor, a Supreme Court justice, the secret to happiness is three words, work that matters. And that's what Tommy Franks has been about his whole life. That's what your leadership is to is all about, is let's go do work that matters, all of us together, in the name of character, communication, common vision, caring, work that matters. Congratulations on the work that you're doing, Delise. Well, thank you. And I've heard you say um, to write your name in the hearts of your fellow man. Do you want to tell us about that? Well, Delise, by now, those that are listening in could probably tell that I could go on and on and on about, you know, about life and life philosophy. Because, you know, Delise, I'm older than all these students, and I've lived an extraordinary life. I've lived a blessed life already. And so I'm very grateful, and, and I enjoy, you know, sharing with people, you know, my life philosophy and uh, what's worked for me in my life to keep me in a mindset where I've never had a bad day. I like to say that I've never had a bad day. And what I mean by that is you got to play, you got to learn how to play a bad hand well. Young ladies and gentlemen, anybody can play a good hand well, but you got to learn how to play a bad hand well. And when, when you're dealt a bad hand, and we all are sometimes, that's when you got to lean on your life philosophy and all the things we're talking about in the four stars of leadership. You know, you got to lean on that life philosophy, like I would lean on faith, family, friends, that sort of thing. And my funny bone, backbone, wishbone, that's all, those are all principles that have worked in my life. And, and it helps me get through the next day. But what you've asked me about is I was a young assistant district attorney in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Now think about that. I spent half my life as a prosecutor and I spent the other half of my life, you know, as a defense lawyer. So I put people on death row and, and, and pushed to have the death penalty carried out. And, and now I'm on the side of life where I try to get people maybe a second chance and keep them out of jail. And um, I focus more on the high chair than the electric chair. Now, uh, I believe in a God of second chances. And I want the young people to hear this particularly. I've learned in my life, there's enough good in the worst of us and enough bad in the best of us that it behooves all of us not to judge each other too harshly. You know, let's look forward to a God of second chances. Let's, let's look forward to the possibility of redemption. Let's look forward to helping each other along the way. Well, I'm an assistant DA back when, and an African-American gentleman named E.M. Gilry, a black lawyer in Muskogee County back during the civil rights movement. He told me this story that when he died, and he was older than me and he died, and they asked me to come speak at his, his funeral at the Antioch Baptist Church in Muskogee, Oklahoma, presided over by Reverend Ben Noble. I remember it like it was yesterday. And they asked me to say something about my mentor, this black attorney named E.M. Guillory. So I told them a story that he had told me. And I've never heard of this story anywhere. I think, it, I think it's borrowed from Chinese mythology to a certain extent. But the story's about 
a, ch a young child who went to an old wise man. In my life, that'd be my mother, my Aunt Mildred, frankly. But a young, the story goes, a young child went to an old wise man. And he said, oh, wise man, I wrote my name in the sand on the beach. And soon the tide came in and washed my name away. And my name was gone. Oh, wise man, I carved my name in the bark at the side of a tree. And soon the tree grew and my name was gone. You know, oh, wise man, what really matters in this life? Give me a reason for living and give me a reason for dying. What really matters? Oh, wise man, I chiseled my name in the stone in the side of a mountain. And soon the wind blew and he wrote in my name away. And once again, my name was gone. What really matters, oh, wise man? And the old wise man looked at the young child and he said, write your name. Inscribe your name in the hearts of your fellow man. And you, my child, shall live and endure forever and ever and ever. And at least that's what life is all about. We inscribe our name in the hearts of other people just based on how we treat each other, just based on how we respect each other, just based on treating each other with kindness as much as possible and following the four principles of leadership that Tommy Franks has exhibited throughout his life. So thanks for asking that question. You, you gave me the opportunity to tell one of my favorite stories. Oh, that's wonderful because I think it, it is a great culmination of all four core principles of leadership. And we appreciate you so much for being with us and working uh, with us on this podcast and sharing your experience with our students and our listeners. I have, um, I, and I think it's a, a wonderful way to wrap up those four core principles um, and something so profound to remember is write your name in the hearts of your fellow man by how we treat others. And that's such an important part of character. Um, I would like to ask you about, you have written a book and um, the wit and wisdom of Mike Turpin. Is that your only book? Right. Do you have other books or, and I know you're a great reader. Tell me about, I, I always hear leaders are readers and I, and I always encourage students to read. And, and I try to read as much as possible. Tell me your thoughts on reading and, and your book and that type of thing. Well, my mother, I mentioned her earlier, my Aunt Mildred and my mother, when I told that story just now, the most important influence in my life was my wonderful mother, Marge. And um, she used to say to me, son, a room without books is like a person without a soul. A room without books is like a person without a soul. That's such a powerful phrase, Elise. But my mother never got a college degree, never went to college. And, but she went to the College of Experience, where the lessons are bumps and bruises, and the school colors were black and blue. She was more you know, worldly and experienced and the best read person I ever did know. I mean, she believed in the ancient technology of ink on paper. Now, the ancient technology of ink on paper is a book. And a book can take you anytime, anywhere. And there's just nothing more powerful than reading books. And I like books, ink on paper, not some Kindle, not some electronic giz, you know, gizmo. But that's okay, too, if you listen to it or, or read it on an a, a electronic e-reader. But I still like, as my mother used to say, you know, the ancient technology of ink on paper. I have books all over my house, all over my car, all over my office. I'm reading um, three different books right now. I mean, just just read, read, read. And, and all the principles we talk about of leadership can be developed by reading and reading and reading. And there's not a book I've read where I don't borrow another idea, where I don't get, I get a brand new thought, perhaps, you know, in, I just, in this conversation here today, I talked about the road to character, you know, in, by David Brooks. That's, I just finished the book, The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson. And that's all about Churchill's first year. His first year, he was prime minister in 1940. Uh, believe this or not, Delise, you've asked me, so I'm going to tell you. In World War II, 75 million people died on this earth. I learned that in this book I just read. I mean, I knew I knew a lot about World War II, and so do the people listening in, the young people. They study world history. But can you believe 75 million people died during World War II? 
To put that in perspective, 5 million people have died during the pandemic worldwide. 800,000 in America, 13,000 in Oklahoma, the pandemic. But, but I'm talking about World War II. 75 million people died in World War II. Now, the book is all about Winston Churchill's first year as prime minister and, and the bombing that took place in London and, and the 40,000 people that were killed right there in London that they had to survive and fight Hitler and finally win World War II and preserve democracy for our country and for those democracies across the earth. Well, I've lived a good life and I could tell a good story here and there. I think I know world history, but I didn't realize that my father, my own father, who was in the invasion of Southern France after D-Day, June 6, 1944 was D-Day. Everybody knows about D-Day. My father, a, year, a month and a half later, parachuted in behind enemy lines in Southern France. You know, it was a suicide mission. He had no chance to live. I shouldn't even be here today talking to you. He, you know, he shouldn't even have made it, but he got a bronze star for bravery. He was part of the greatest generation that Tommy Franks is so proud of and, and, and talks so you know, highly of. My point is that only when I read this book here recently about Winston Churchill did I realize how many people died during World War II. 75. It's, it's just incredible to me. And, it's incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible. My, my point is we're not fighting World War III right now. We got World War II, 75 million, but, but we got to do everything we can to preserve our democracy. And my daddy used to say to his three sons, born free is a privilege. Dying free is a responsibility. My World War II veteran father with a bronze star said to his three sons, born free is a privilege. Dying free is a responsibility. It's our responsibility to maintain our freedom. And every young person needs to understand that. And I'm telling you, I've heard Tommy Frank speak again and again in a very patriotic way about our freedom and the men and women that have fought for that throughout the 246 year history of America. Think about that. America is only 246 years old. You know, that's three times my mother's age when she died. We're still a fair, fairly young experiment in democracy. America's only 246 years old. Think about that. That so, is, we're just babies. We're babies. We got a ways to go. And that's why everything we're talking about matters so much. It matters so much. Absolutely. So, thank you, and I, I love that what he said, born free is a privilege, dying free is a responsibility, because that's yeah. why we are developing young leaders. General Frank says all the students in the classroom today are tomorrow's next governors, attorney generals, prime ministers, the president of the United States, they, they are the, the young people today are the leaders of tomorrow. And it's so okay. important that we give them and instill in them an understanding of importance and, and, and almost an urgency of how important it is that they understand this responsibility and that we're here to help them and help them develop yeah. as young leaders. And we right. appreciate you so much. Yeah, thank you. And I'd like to close with, you ain't giving, you ain't living. But my most, big, my most important message is my own pastor at my own church. And I said it earlier when he says, hold fast to what is good. Hold fast to what, there's so much good in this world, in this country, in our lives. And we need our young leaders that you're talking about to hold fast to what is good. And what is good about what we've talked about is the four stars of leadership, you know, that Tommy Franks has exhibited throughout his life. I mean, those four stars of leadership, if you will, those four pillars of leadership right there will serve these young people for the rest of their lives. Thank you so much. Mike Turpin, we have been honored to have you with us today, honored to share your thoughts and experience with our students and our listeners. And we thank you sincerely for, in, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Delaney. Thanks for having me. You're yeah. so welcome. Yeah. Have a good day. Have a good life. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you again to REI Oklahoma for making this podcast possible. For nearly 40 years, the board, staff, patrons, and supporters of the nonprofit economic development REI Oklahoma are committed to expanding Oklahoma's economic prosperity, earning the reputation of being one of the most comprehensive economic development organizations in the country. 
business loans, training workshops, business consulting, and networking opportunities, as well as technical assistance and even commercial business space are made available to Oklahoma entrepreneurs and small businesses. For low and moderate income individuals and families, down payment and or closing cost assistance is offered. Learn more at reiok.org. This has been the Four Star Leadership Podcast. Now it's your turn, Four Star listeners. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and let us know what you thought of this episode. Be sure to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and tune in next month for our next episode that airs every last Friday each month. Go be great.